I'd rather, I'd rather make a mistake and be guided than be afraid to step out there in the first place. Amen. So that's this morning. Uh, I was going to do it after church, but not being scheduled to preach this morning, I am now. So I'm going to share that part. Then I'm going to give you a break for 15 minutes to have a coffee. Then I'm going to call you back. And uh, I'm going to talk about an update on deliverance, uh, how to set people free very quickly, very easily, uh, without getting sued in Australia, how we do it now and and, uh, how effective and powerful it is. Uh, I'm going to show you that because that's what we're fully expecting you to be able to do. That's GP for Christians, general practice. That's not a specialist ministry. That's for all of you, amen. You can all do it. Amen. You all got the Spirit of God on you. Space birth two. Come with me to the book of Revelation, chapter 12. And we're going Revelation, chapter 12. I'm going to connect it to Space Birth 1, which I preached um, a f- couple of weeks back. Verse 1 through to 3. The woman, the child, and the dragon. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven, behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. Those first two verses of Revelation 12 speaks of a sign in the heavens, an astronomical picture in the sky over Jerusalem. And amazingly, on Fran's birthday next year, 23rd of September 2017, the very picture described here is seen in the skies or will be seen in the skies over Jerusalem for that day only. It's very exciting. We now know through the Stellarium program that is free, you can download, you can check it and there is no equal to it in thousands of years. There certainly won't be for hundreds of years into the future. The Bible calls this a great sign. And prophecy speakers end times, everybody seems to be of the same opinion that there's something very significant about that date, 23rd of September 2017. It would be lovely to be in Jerusalem at that time to have a look at the sky. hope it's not cloudy. But you'll see it. And you'll see the constellation Virgo and you'll see that there's an alignment above her head with the sun and below her feet with the moon and Leo, the constellation above her with 12 stars, normally nine, but there's three wandering stars, planets that come into alignment to make 12, and, uh, so, which is quite amazing. Then Jupiter, the king star, is in her womb, the womb of Virgo, for nine and a half months. Enters the womb around the 3rd of December this year and exits it in September next year. So there's literally a space birth, if you like, of the planet Jupiter coming out of Virgo. Exactly the thing described in Revelation 12 that we just read, the woman is pregnant. And I shared that message because the Lord really spoke to me, not so much about us, because actually that picture in the sky hasn't got much to do with the church, but an awful lot to do with Israel. I felt the Lord was saying to me, I'm bringing something to birth in Israel that has never been seen before. There's a spiritual renewal of the people. God's attention is turning to His own people, His nation, that we've been born from. We're the rootstock of Israel. Hallelujah. And so God's attention is turning back to His people. This is the season that we're in. It's tremendous, the timing of it, around the Feast of Trumpets and the, the, the New Year. Next year, it's amazing how God moves. This is a sure sign of the heavens. Does it mean we're going to get raptured at that time? I hope so. Amen? I really hope so. I can't definitively say so. But I've got a feeling that God's nearly finished with the church. 
we're at the final ingathering of saints. There has to be a spiritual movement sweeping the earth of the Holy Ghost pouring out His Spirit on nation after nation after nation, bringing millions and millions of people into the kingdom of God. This is like the last sweep, I believe, the final ingathering of souls into the kingdom of those who will believe in Jesus Christ. I'm convinced Australia has its turn in this next season. Time's running out for us. 2017... May it be Australia's year. May there be millions born again in this country. Hallelujah. There's millions being born again in Iran. You know, if Iranians can get saved, so can we. Amen. So can Aussies. Amen. We shouldn't be outnumbered by Iranians in heaven, should we? Well, it doesn't matter if we are. (coughs) Praise God. They're getting born. Muslims are coming to Christ at such a rapid rate, they don't even want to talk about it. Jesus is visiting them by the millions and they're coming to the Lord. He's bringing the church age to a close. Things are moving fast. And Jesus said to look up because you know that when you see these things, your redemption is drawing near. Come with me to the book of Luke chapter 21. And I'm going to come back and talk about the dragon for a moment. Luke 21. Thank you, Lord. Verse 25 through to uh, 28. And there will be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars and on the earth, distress of nations. With perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Now when these things begin to happen, look up and lift your heads, because your redemption draws near. Amen. When they begin to happen, look up. There's a timing of the Lord's coming for his people. Look up. I believe the next year is a year of intense intercession for the nation of Israel. I believe we're entering a season which I will call the season of turning, the season of teshuva, where God's people must turn their hearts back to the Lord. You cannot still be steeped in sins at that time. You've got to have turned and turned and turned and let the Lord deal with you so that you are ready as part of that bride of Christ for him when he comes. I've never known a bride not get ready for a wedding. I've known a bride get late because I've married a few off and uh, stood around for a while trying to keep the best, the the groom happy. The grooms get nervous, you know. Unbelievably nervous. You've got to talk them. You can keep talking to them. You know, that's the job of the best man. You okay, mate? You okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. One girl was an hour late I said to the groom, I'm on overtime, mate. I'm getting overtime right now. All she had to do was walk across the road. I wanted to know, what's she doing? But you know, the Holy Spirit has a job, and it's to get the church ready. He will present you without spot or wrinkle. So he, he's going to get you ready for Jesus. And if the Holy Ghost is grooming you for Christ, guess what? He's going to do a good job, and you will be ready. You won't think you are, but you will be ready. And the church needs to know so that we're not in the dark. We are sons of light, the Bible says. We're not sons of darkness, amen. We know about these things. So it's not a time for us to be afraid. And the last thing I want you to be today when you leave this place is afraid of what I've said to you. It's a time to be excited. You know that God's judgment is coming over the earth. That all of these things written in the Bible will come to pass. Everything written, every prophecy will come to pass. We're in the hour and the season of change in our lives. And so the next year is going to be busy for you if you're going to follow the lead of the Holy Spirit. You're certainly going to be in prayer and you're certainly going to have the Holy Spirit nudging you and urging you to press on, press on, press on, press on. Don't give up. Don't back away. Don't, don't lose focus. Stay alert. Stay. If there ever was a year, 2017, it's got to be the year where you're praying 
and there will be a lot of pressure against you. There'll be lots of reasons why you can't pray. There'll be lots of reasons why you should just sit down and have a breather. But I'm telling you, you've got to keep going. You've got to press on because I don't want to lose you. My job is to nurse you and nudge, urge you and nudge you on. So perhaps my messages may get a little bit more pointed to push you on so that we don't lose anybody out of this church. Amen. Uh, we're all going together. Hallelujah. And others that will come and join us. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So that's a space birth. You'll have to watch the YouTube clip because there's a lot more about that. But I want to talk to you now about verse 3 of Revelation chapter 12. Let's go back there and refresh ourselves of what it says. Verse 3, and another sign. Everybody say, and another sign. So there's a great sign. Now there's, and another sign. Wow. Appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his head. Powerful thing in the heavens appears at this time. While I was thinking about the sign in the heaven, I was thinking about Hydra, the snake constellation, is under the feet of the woman, which kind of fulfills Genesis chapter 3, but then I realized it's often there. It's, that's where it is. And it doesn't seem to fit verse 3 so much, because it doesn't look like a dragon, it looks like a snake. So I'm saying, Lord, what is this thing? What, is it relevant to the, the astronomy? Is it relevant to the cosmos? Is this a thing? So I go searching to find out if it's a thing. Is there another star approaching? Is there something approaching? Is there something in this picture that completes it? Because I know that the Lord does not speak unless He means it. He doesn't give us information for the sake of it. We are told for a very good reason so that we should be aware and alert. In 1991, there was an American naval officer in New Zealand by the name of Morrison. I did have his information. Morrison. He was the lead astronomer at the time based at Black Birch near Blenheim in the South Island of New Zealand. I don't know if any of you have been, been to Blenheim or been to the South Island of New Zealand. Anybody been to New Zealand? <laughs> Do you know where it is? Anyway, just mentioned the All Blacks. That's where they come from. Anyway, in the South Island, there's an observatory at Black Birch. And in that place, the Americans were there in 1991 observing the sky. This man uh, saw something beyond our solar system approaching us. And he named it Planet X. Two days later, he was dead. He published his findings, and NASA announced that he died of esophageal cancer in two days. Now, if you know something about esophageal cancer, you can survive more than two days. It takes a lot longer than that to develop and kill you. Anyway, at that point, NASA shut the door on his findings, even though it's still public and you can still find what he said. He said there is something coming from beyond our solar system and approaching us. He saw it with an eight-inch telescope. And uh, in 1983, NASA said something similar, but he named it, and he was the first one. And I thought, the guy was honest, and then they shut the doors. So I'm thinking, what's going on, Lord? There's something happening that we don't know about. We haven't been told about. And so I went searching, and if you go searching for things like this, you know you're going to get a lot of rubbish out there. The Catholics have built an observatory on Mount Graham in America. It's an infrared called the Lucifer Project camera that's searching the skies. And so it's, they give you the thing that they're searching everywhere, just looking around. They're pinpointed on something they're just not telling anybody what it is. Now, if the Catholics have found out something, don't you think they should tell their people? If the governments know something, don't you think they should warn people? And so, what is it that's coming? So, I have some information for you this morning 
that I'm going to post factual data to back it up on the Facebook page that I have found out. This is the, what I believe is the truth. You can believe what you want to believe. But there is a brown dwarf star approaching us. It's called Nemesis. It's a dark star or a black star. And you can only see it in infrared light. Some astronomers have said our sun is part of a binary system where there is a co-star that revolves around the sun, comes way out past the Oort cloud and comes around every few thousand years. Nobody's really sure. But you can't see it, and astronomers can't see it on normal telescopes. So it requires a very, very expensive telescope to be able to see that far in infrared. It appears to be red as it's drawing closer to the sun. And so now astronomers are getting early views of something that's a dark shape out there. It's inside our solar system as we speak. It appears to have two wings, which they think is an iron red dust cloud trailing both sides. So if you can see, it looks like it's got two horns. It has seven planets orbiting it. So it's like a dark sun with seven planets around it. And one of those planets they call Nibiru. Another planet they call Wormwood. You may remember Wormwood from the book of Revelation about the devastation that it could cause if it came into contact. Well, in actual fact, the Bible says it does come into contact with the earth. A star falls from heaven. I'll come back to that. The system is called Planet X is incoming and threatening the civilization of the earth. Nibiru, which is one of, this, one of the planets, is currently in our inner solar system, somewhere between and below the orbits of Saturn and Neptune. So is it there or isn't it there? There's a lot of cover-up going on, and there's a massive smoke screen, and the biggest of them all is called global warming, which has now been debunked, but because it's been spoken of so many times, people just believe it now. It's just ridiculous. 31,000 scientists in America have approached the president and said, we don't believe this is true science. 31,000. But of course, the American administration have just ignored that. So there's no rhyme or reason about it. It is a manufa- yes, man has messed the planet up. I know we've polluted it. We've done bad things to it. But most of it's not caused by global warming. It's caused by something else. What the astronomers do know is that every planet in our solar system is being moved by something coming closer. The, the magnetic field of this thing, because it's much bigger than Neptune, and certainly a lot bigger than Earth, is moving the axis of the planets slightly and is changing the weather patterns, messing them around on all of the planets that are further out from us. So they know the effects that this thing's having as it's coming through. What is its expected path is to move around the sun and go out again. Um, fortunately, it's probable that the earth is in the tail of this thing as it moves past. The Bible talks about a time when the earth, the sun will go dark, possibly for three days. Well, let me put that into context. When the moon eclipses the earth, or rather gets in between the earth and the sun, we call that a, an eclipse. It takes eight minutes. That's how small it is, eight minutes. But this thing takes three days to pass through. Um, it's been rejected as pseudoscience by Wikipedia. So you can go on to Wikipedia, they'll just tell you straight up, it's an internet hoax. National Geographic in 2009 called it a doomsday myth, 2009, seven years ago. Um, they associated with a woman called Nancy Leader, L-I-E-D-E-R, Nancy Leader, because if you get associated with her, nobody's going to call you a weedo because she talks to aliens. So she's in contact with aliens on this planet. <laughs> they were telling her things. 
All right. So then the government's been able to push this right to the lunatic fringe in terms of science and in terms of, you know, who in their right mind would believe such a thing. So all up, you'll get this from the governments. It's a doomsday conspiracy. And I'm not into conspiracies. I'm not into doomsday talk. I'm just into the Bible. However, when I find out stuff like this, I'm going to tell you because it's my job to tell you. Uh, And you can do with it what you will. When is this thing likely to pass? Possibly within a year. It's past will come around the sun, but within the next three and a half years, it's going to be close to us. So you can read all of the prophecies that were spoken by Jeremiah and Isaiah and all of them speak about this time, but it's, it's not something God's not in control of. He made it. The Bible says He made the destroyer. And this planet is called the destroyer planet. And so it's under the Lord's control and guidance. Even though it's a seems like a dragon coming through. It's not actually the devil. So you can be fooled into thinking, oh, this thing's demonic. It's not demonic. It's just something God made that's revolving around, but it's coming very close to us. And I think it's going to shake the world in ways that we would never expect. What else would bring such fear to people's hearts? Certainly if you go out there and put placards around your neck and walk up and down and say the world is ending, the sky's falling, they have a little room to put you in, you know. They put us all in that room, we can walk around the little room then, you know. They, they won't shake them, they'll just think you're a bunch of fools. But they already think the gospel is foolish to start with, so anything the church says, you know, is, they're gonna, that's just foolish. And they'll, so they'll, they'll say you're just one of those Nancy Leader type people talking to talking to demons. And so there's a whole plethora of people that believe that aliens are coming to save the planet. And uh, so you can imagine where this is going. You know, we know full well that they're not aliens, they're demons. And so the enemy will use this as a, as a plan to deceive even the nations, which he's already deceived. So, you know, once somebody's fooled, it's not hard to keep fooling them. You just make the story a bit longer. Hallelujah. So let's come to First Th- Thessalonians chapter 5. Now, I had some pictures to show you, but for some strange reason, my computer wouldn't work this morning. I rebooted it and rebooted it. I couldn't get anything copied off it onto a stick. It just wouldn't wouldn't work, even if I shouted at it. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 through to 5. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord... So comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and a helmet of hope for salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are also edifying. Hallelujah. So there's the Apostle Paul telling us that we're awake. These things shouldn't surprise you. We are the generation of the end. We're the enders, finishers. We are. And so we've got a job to do, to stand strong in this hour. We need the power of the Holy Spirit so we don't go wobbly at the knees or get afraid that we're going to get blasted by comets. This system is pushing ahead of it an enormous amount of space junk and debris and dragging behind it millions of comets. So we're going to have debris showers as time goes on. But when it comes past, 
that's where its biggest damage will be. In, in the, this, it'll move, it won't destroy the earth, but it'll move the crust. So it's like pulling your skin right around the other way and then letting it go. So that's what it'll do. It'll turn the crust and then just let it go. So where are you going to hide? How deep do you have to go? Um, and then after that, the comet showers coming over the earth. So I could see it timing quite well with God's word, uh, if indeed it's real. I want to bring you now to an executive order coordinating efforts to prepare the nation for space weather events. Let me say it again. Coordinating efforts to prepare the nation for space weather events. Not global warming on it. Space weather events. Who wrote this? President Obama released it just a couple of weeks ago. Let me read you a little bit of what he's saying. By the authority vested in me as president by the Constitution and laws of the United States of America and to prepare the nation for space weather events, it is hereby ordered as follows. Section 1. Space weather events in the form of solar flares, solar energetic particles and geomagnetic disturbances occur regularly. Some with measurable effects on critical infrastructure systems and technologies such as the global positioning system, satellite operations and communications, aviation and the electrical power grid. Extreme space weather events, those that could significantly degrade critical infrastructure, could disable large portions of the electrical power grid, resulting in cascading failures that would affect key services and water supply, health care and transportation. Space weather has the potential to simultaneously affect and disrupt health and safety across entire continents. Did you hear that? Self health and safety across entire continents. Successfully preparing for space weather events is an all-of-nation endeavor that requires partnerships across governments, emergency managers, academia, the media, the insurance industry, non-profits, and the private sector. Uh, but not you. Not the average person. So he, here is President Obama saying something. Never before has a president ever issued such a statement. Never. Does he say there's anything coming... No, it doesn't say it at all. He's just saying, look, there's some bad weather in space. We better get ready. <laughs> so, I think that it's very exciting. Come with me to the book of Revelation again. I just don't think I'm going to get old enough to grab the pension. That's bugging me more than anything. But Then I think the way that they kind of nursing it is it's not going to be there anyway <laughs> you get the feeling that pension yeah anyway we just trust the Lord eh? Revelation chapter 6 verse 12 it's during this, the breaking of seals I looked this is John I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the soon became, sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll, and it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come and who is able to stand? Come with me to Revelation 8. We'll read verse 10 and 11. Then the third angel sounded and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. Uh, sorry, yeah, became Wormwood. And many died from the water because it was made bitter. Now this is either a doomsday conspiracy or it isn't. The system is already having an effect upon us. On earth already, these are the things that are happening. There's been a rise in temperature, rise in volcanoes, the number of them, severe and extreme weather patterns. The sea level rises. Land rises and collapses. 
there's sinkholes, there's expansion cracks, there's crust displacements already. <laughs> On the sun there are solar flares, one of them passed the earth not long ago, just months ago, passed us, solar flare, Phew, straight out. Fortunately it missed us. If it had hit us, I don't know, might have made a difference to our life. There's solar wind coming off. At the moment, the sun is quiet, and it's like the quiet before the storm. I've listened to so many YouTube clips that I don't want to listen to anymore, quite frankly. And one of the reasons why I haven't shown you too many pictures, I thought, they're taking pictures of things that's not it. They're using pictures of Neptune and different stars to show something because they can't photograph it. I remember a few years ago, almost 20 years ago, we had a ministry here called Men and Mountains. And I sent some guys down to Mount Funnel, which is south of Mackay, near Ilbilby, the thriving m- metropolis called Ilbilby. <laughs> and there's Funnel Mountain. Has anybody seen Funnel Mountain? It's like a plug of rock. And it looks like a funnel upside down. It's just a plug of rock. And we consider that to be our southernmost point of our parish. So I sent the guys down there to climb funnel rock with a Bible, with some oil, with a stake and claim it for Jesus Christ as our southernmost point. There was a very large guy in the team and of course he couldn't climb the ropes. They used ropes to get up there. And uh, they found a hole in the middle. So they threw the Bible, they threw the whole Bible down there. I said, why'd you do that? They said, well, we want to get the word right down there. So I said, okay. <laughs> they poured oil down there. They claimed that mountain. They were having a worship time and they were have walkie-talkie contact with the man called Alfred, young, young Alfred down the bottom. And Alfred said, what is that coming towards me? He saw, he couldn't actually see it, but he saw the, 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 the grass going down both sides of this big thing looming towards him and he froze to the spot and it went right past him and, and he saw all the grass moving and everything just moving, this thing just ran. He said, what are you guys doing? He said, we're just worshipping. Why? He said, something just ran away. Something big just went right past me. That was 20 years ago. Alfred, poor guy, freaked him right out. Of course, it was a demon leaving the mountain. What's happening in the skies is something similar as this thing comes through that we can't see it, but it's having an effect on all the planets. So the, the, the magnetic pull on it even affects the sun. But God is using it. So is it going to strike the earth? I have no idea. I've listened to some people who said the thing's going to collide with the earth. You know, I'm not going to be chicken little and say the sky's falling in because we already know it's going to. We know that there's going to be a pole shift as this thing comes past. What's a pole shift? Well, north and south pole, north, south, goes like that. Doing as, the, as your skin, as the crust gets pulled around, all of a sudden the north pole is not at the north pole anymore. It's somewhere else. So there's an axis tilt that's going to create an almighty movement of the ocean waters. Now, at the equator, the water is higher than it is at the North Pole or in the, in, the, in the higher parts of the planet, it mounts up. It's quite significantly higher because of the rotation of the earth and because of the magnetic field. But you shift it and you release all that water. This is what the scientists are saying. So I was listening to that and I thought, my goodness, where's it all going to go? Mackay? Well, we're at least five feet above sea level. We'll be all right. A 700-foot wave can move inland for 200 miles. Where are you going to go? How, moving at 1,000 kilometers an hour. This is the modeling that they've done. They're doing modeling, but saying nothing. <laughs> so the elite know about it. So they've gone and moved. CEOs of companies are resigning in America and moving inland. When naval officers retire, they, they say to them, you need to move to the Ozarks, which is a mountain region. America, so there are a lot of Americans in the know, and they're moving. The president of Russia, Mr. Putin, has called home every Russian. It's the truth, isn't it, Andre? 
Putin has called home every Russian to come home. Is that because there's going to be a World War III? He said there's something far more important going on than that and said nothing else. So I, I think, and I'm angry at the governments of the world, and particularly our own Australian government, surely they know nobody's said a word. Linda? If I was a responsible prime minister, I would get my nation ready. I'd find out where Australians can go. Surely you would do something. This is what really irritates me, is that they only want the elite to survive. What are they going to do, just leave us out there? Thank God I think we're not going to be here. So that's why I'm not afraid. I'm angry at the evil intent of the world's governments and the fact that they've sworn each other to secrecy and I'm convinced the Australian government has to know. But nothing has been said. There is no comment anywhere about this. Either we're wrong or we're right. Or either I'm wrong or I'm right. In the book of Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 24, verse 20, the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Hallelujah. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. What's going to make that happen? Well, God will. But what God is doing. This planet will come past and it's going to make the earth. Thank goodness we're not going to be here. I can't imagine that we're going to be here. If you are going to be here, you need to hang on to the Lord. Because I don't think there's a hole deep enough to hide in. And the funny thing is, a lot of the elites have dug tunnels under the ground. Now my b- brain tells me, hole in ground, water coming across, not a good idea. You're going to drown. It's just my thinking. I'm shocked at our governments. I'm I'm shocked at how evil this is. Because if this is true, millions are going to die. Millions. Possibly billions. They will die. But the thing is, who somebody needs to speak. And that's why I'm speaking to you, so that you can pray for the salvation of many souls. Because they're not just being saved from a tsunami, they've been saved from what comes after that, from a certain hell. And because of their sins. It's because of sin, and it's because of the rejection of Jesus Christ that they're going to have to go through this. And there will be many saved, so the earth's not going to be completely wiped out. Many will be saved during this tribulation period. It could well be that the tribulation could start the beginning of October next year or late September. Who knows? But I just know this. We all know something's changing. We all know in our spirit something's moving. And we all know that things are not the same anymore. And we cannot just carry on and pretend that it is because it isn't. She's not all right. The earth is going to hell in a handbasket. And we must preach the gospel. We must save as many people as we possibly can because our governments are not interested I think that's just evil, that they will not tell the story. Yeah, there'll be mass panic, but people would want to know what to do. The Lord loves people. We love people. They're going to think we're crackpots if we tell them this, but it already is in the Bible. Cosmic disturbance is coming, and God is using it to bring wrath on the earth. And whether I've got the details right today or not, I don't know, but I I know I'm on the right track. Let's pray. Father God, it breaks our heart to know such loss is coming. Yet you have worn the earth and you sent your son to save mankind. You have a salvation plan, Lord, and we know it's called the gospel. We believe it. Help us, Lord, in this hour not to be afraid, not to walk in fear, but to know full well that our future is secure. We are not appointed to wrath. You will come and save your bride. But she must be busy at this moment. Let us learn what it means to be a bride. Not to walk around with a faded veil, but a very clean one. The linen clean of the Bible. Help us, Lord, at this time to be alert and in prayer 
so that you can speak to our hearts the things that have been sealed up since the time of Daniel and are now being re released to the saints of the last times. Lord, we give thanks that we are called to be here at this time. We are the people of the last days. We've been equipped. We are here, Lord God. By your power, this job will be finished. We'll be here at the end, Lord God. And we just give thanks for the strength of Almighty God in each one of us and even in our children that we do not talk for you, we do not walk for you. We've been delivered from it, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's be people of the day. And we give thanks, Lord God, that as many as possible will be saved in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome back. Uh, thanks for, for doing this. Um, we may do more of these little debriefs because I, I think it's good for um, equipping and, and uh, others that are skilled in certain areas can talk as well. But I want to sh do an update on deliverance because uh, we've had a few cases in the church recently. But I want to reflect back from what I learned from the Lord some time ago. We have a, a little track sheet that's got eight points of deliverance on it and uh, which we can hand out to those of you who would like that. In fact, we'll probably post it to the Facebook or we'll just give you, it's a sheet. However, it, it does miss a particular point that I want to raise today about the livers. Now, number one, this is, this is not a specialist ministry. I want to make this really clear. It's not, a speci it's not special people that do deliverance. This is all Christians Jesus quite clearly said in Luke, uh, sorry, in Mark chapter 16, verse 17, and these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will cast out demons. So this is what I call GP, general practice for Christians, normal Christian life. When you come across it, you can deal with it. It's not such a big deal, seriously. Demons know what they've got to do when Jesus is around. The problem is not the demons. The problem is always the human being. It's getting their agreement to be with you, uh, to go through the process. Once you've secured their agreement, you can go to another step. So that's the first thing. I always seek permission from the person who has a spirit so that we can minister to them. So number one, you've got to seek permission. If you haven't got their permission... You are wasting your time. You can shout all day long if you want. But until they are ready to agree with you, I'm talking about the person, not the demon. When there's agreement between you and the person, or you two or whoever's with you, and I suggest somebody is with you, uh, then you can move forward. There's authority and there's power. Uh, so I've prayed for a lot of people and in the end just given up because I realized they're not ready. Uh, particularly people who are mentally ill uh, and on a pension. Because something happens during the process with a lot of them where the demon seems to whisper to them, you're going to lose your pension. And then they realize, if I get healed, if I get set free, I won't have a pension anymore. And they clam up. And that's happened so many times that um, they would rather live life a victim with a pension then be free and have to face it on their own. So unfortunately, that happens uh, a lot. So you can't do anything. I mean, you can cast them out. You, you can just cast a demon out of somebody. But if they're not ready and they're not ministered to afterwards, you know what the Bible says, don't you? It'll come back. Yeah. Knocking on the door. Anybody home? Yeah. Can I come back in? I've got some friends. Yeah. Seven friends. Yeah. My goodness. That's what Jesus said. So here, it's very important to encourage the person, seek the permission, then I encourage them with the Word of God, particularly that they are born again, they have an authority from heaven, and when you exercise that authority, you will realize how powerful you are. This is your spiritual house. So we talk like that to them. Um, if I'd had more time, I actually asked them to fast for a day, 
And it brings, fasting just brings a spiritual awareness to people. And so if I'm going to do it, I'll fast too for a day. The Bible doesn't say you have to, but it helps them get ready. And it helps them sort of mark a line in the sand, this is my freedom day, and I'm coming, I've fasted. They've read a couple of scriptures. They know the authority of the Lord, and they're ready to be prayed for. You don't always get that. That's nice. It's very quick then. I do deliverance without manifestation. If the demons are manifesting, I stop. Because you haven't got your friend's attention or the patient's attention. If you haven't got their attention, you can't engage them in the deliverance process. You can shout all you like. And I've seen this many times, even in Africa, people just shouting and shouting. And, not, and this poor person's on the ground just writhing around or whatever it is they're doing. And so I'll always step in to stop that because it's not fair on the person. I've seen girls that are just so beautifully dressed that's rolling around in the dirt. It's just horrible. It's, it's, it's. Anyway, so what you do is, this is how you stop a demon. You bind it. And you bind the spirit before you begin. Before you say the word Jesus, <laughs> particularly before you mention him, bind the demon. And how do you bind a demon? You just say it. Demon, I bind you. I forbid you to manifest. And if it speaks, I say, shut up in the name of Jesus. Or, be quiet in the name of Jesus. I'll quiet it down. I, won't even, I don't have conversations with demons. One recently said to me, I don't like you. And I said, I don't like you either. Shut up. In Jesus' name, I forbid you. And so I will hold the person's face gently and call them by name. So if if a name's Sarah, I'll say, Sarah, Sarah. I'll call Sarah until Sarah comes back. And then you know you've got Sarah's attention. She's back. So Sarah, will you pray with me? If Sarah says yes, I'll pray with you. You can lead her in a prayer where she will rededicate her life to the Lord. And then she will then evict the demon herself. Now, I said before, this system should lead to us never getting sued. Because part of gaining a person's permission for the deliverance is also saying, you're going to cast it out yourself. We're going to agree with you. So we're not casting out demons on our own. We're only standing with the person who is actually self-delivering. And this is how it works. There are other ways to do it. I found this a good way because there's no manifestation. You've got the person's agreement. They're doing it. You're agreeing with them. Even though you're probably taking the spiritual lead for them because they're not in a position really to do it for themselves. We used to say to them, this is a mistake we made, you have sovereign will. You just have to exercise it. That's a mistake and it's not biblical. If they had sovereign will, they wouldn't need your help. They just do it. Nobody has sovereign will. Only God has sovereign will. We have human will, which is quite weak. It's only His will that you be set free that works. So all we're doing is yielding to the will of God. That's all you have to do. Yield to the will of God, which is far stronger. His will is that you be free. And He will activate that immediately. The person prays a prayer of dedication. So what's a prayer of dedication? Lord Jesus, I belong to you. I'm your child. I believe in you. That's a prayer of dedication. I I rededicate my life to you. And so lead them in a prayer of dedication. So just, it doesn't have to be deep and going on forever. I just get them to rededicate their lives to Jesus Christ in a simple prayer. Lord, forgive me for my sins. Lord, I, I forgive those who have sinned against me. And, uh, and so then I will go on. You say it, you get them to follow you. Get them to say what you say. And tell them to say it to Jesus. It's very important that they speak out of their mouth. If you're just saying a prayer and they're just nodding, nothing's going to happen. They have to activate their faith. They have to speak. There's something about speaking out of the mouth as a Christian that activates in the spirit realm. It's right, Matt, hey? And so you've got to get them to talk. And if they won't talk, you've got to stop and you've got to go back to the beginning and seek their permission and say, we're doing this together. 
you must speak. And uh, unless they've got a mute spirit, they can talk. Amen. We did deal once with a mute spirit, and we're telling the lady to speak, and then we realized she was dumb. And then she, we saw her build up like this. And she yelled at the top of her voice. Frightened all of us. And her children ran away from her because they'd never ever heard her speak before. And then she spoke, and we were able to lead her through. But she needed to be healed of that first. Anyway, that's going to be a rare case, but they do happen. Some that have more than one demon could have them queuing up to have a go. And if they're manifesting, you've just got to back off. Don't be frightened of manifestation. The person's not in control. And so I will hold them or I'll get four or five strong men to help me. I'll just hold them and I'll just tap the person's face and say, Sarah, Sarah, calling Sarah, heaven to Sarah, (laughs) Pastor Ken to Sarah, hello, Sarah, are you there? Are you there? And uh, eventually she'll come back. I say, right, Sarah, is that you? Yes. Great, let's proceed through the prayer. Once they start praying, if the demon's bound and they start praying, chances are you're going to get them set free. At that point, you have success, almost guarantee it. But they've got to say the prayer. They've got to go with you. And when they say the prayer, then take them through the second stage. The first is dedication. The second is eviction. I get them to say, that demon I command you to depart from me in the name of Jesus Christ. I am evicting you now. So I get them to say those words. And the moment they say now, I start. I say, in the name of Jesus. So anybody that said, we're driving you out. You're going out now in Jesus' name. And so at that point, very few demons have got a footing to stand there. So you're going to have success. And there may be more than one. Uh, They may cough. Coughing's pretty common. They may feel tingling in their fingertips or their toes. Um, They may... What else do they do? Yeah, I don't like vomit. I don't do vomit. Okay. Not when I'm holding their face. Hello, Sarah. Sarah. It has happened that you get vomit projectile. But if you're binding the demon, then the vomit is not a projectile usually. If they vomit, it's not going to go all over. I don't like vomit. It's good to have a... Yeah, it can be dry reaching, but it's good to have a bucket there. But, um, yeah, it's just so... But the, the main thing is that you must bind the demon. You have authority to bind it inside. If they've given you permission, they have given you the right to speak into their life, bind it. Don't mention Jesus until you bind the demon. Because... It'll, it can react. Once you get a reaction, then it can take you a while to get their attention back. The poor girl that was rolling in the dirt that night, Francis was with me, and the pastor was doing his best, and I asked him politely if I could show him what we'd learnt. So he graciously let us. 30 seconds it took us to call her attention. She prayed the prayer, cast the spirit out. It left her, and her friends took her away. 30 seconds after... How long this girl was rolling on the ground, I don't know. But Yeah, it becomes a spectacle. And uh, I'm expecting you to come across it, even in your private life. So you agree and you move in faith. You pray together with them. Be strong. This is when you're driving it out. There's no P's and Q's here. There's no political correctness in the spirit realm. You're you're out of here. You're gone. You're going now. We're finished with you. You've had your day. Get out in Jesus' name. Go now. All of you. You've got some friends. You're all out. All of it. All out. And so very firm. Drive them out. So I get the person to even go like, out. Because there's something in, in the, the, the word that, that, that's just like that. It's, an, it's a force from the inside. Out. And it's, there's a strength of faith in it. And I just trust God. It's doing that in them. And it, and it goes. You can usually tell when it's done because they just go limp. Sometimes it's a, it's a decoy, but most of the times they'll just go limp. And um, then what you've got to do is just pray for them. 
I ask them how they feel. People say, don't do that. But I, I, I said, genuinely, you can feel different. They feel lighter. If they say, oh, I feel lighter, I feel peace, then you know the job's done. So once you've spoken to them about how, you, how they feel, um, pray with them then. Seal that place up in the Holy Ghost. We seal, we fill this, because you've got to fill them with the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, come and fill them. Uh, and pray for them like that. Seal this up. Because the moment they leave you, they're going to have to exercise some kind of faith because that spirit's going to want to come back. Now, it may harass them, so you could get a phone call. That's the next stage. Then is encouragement to them to know that they can be strong in the Lord and the power of their might. And all they've got to do is speak scriptures because this thing will attack them from the outside wanting to get back in, but can't because the door's closed. And so we'll attack that Christian until that Christian realizes the game's... The, sorry, the demon realizes the game's over. But they have to exercise their authority and drive it away from them at home in their private life and may have to do it numbers of times. I once went to a house in... What's happened to the uh, sound, right? Well, I got louder. Can you turn me down a little, please? Out in Jesus' name. I was in Cairns and I went to a house cleansing, meaning not cleaning the house but dealing with demons. I was talking to the lady and I I took a guy with me and she confessed that she was a witch. And I thought, hmm, should have referred this to the senior pastor at the time. Anyway, we talked to her and she described the whole spirit realm to us as we were there. So we just led her in in, in through this system. I think it it was very similar. She described to us what was happening, how they were leaving. It was a great lesson for me. And I got more encouraged as I went along. (coughs) Went through the whole house. Then she said, by the way, when you're leaving, they're all in the driveway. I said, thank you for telling me, because I've got to get to my car. uh, But she had a lot of trouble after that. I mean, I'd no sooner got home and she's on the phone. She said, they're attacking us, they're attacking us. I said, you've just got to stand strong now. We'll, We'll keep praying with you. She'd been in witchcraft, so these things really gave her a hard time for months. But she started to fight back, knowing full well that they couldn't come in. She described a a familiar spirit as a wolf, a black wolf to us, sitting next to her. And and I thought, that's all I need, a black wolf in here. Anyway, she started crying. I said, why are you crying? She said, I'm in grief because even though this is a demon, it's been like my false friend for so long. I'm in grief that it's going, and so she wept over it. So you come across a lot of funny things like that, and familiar spirits will be one of the things you'll come across because they, they get into family lines and they mimic family members. In fact, in many tribes, it's the, they mimic them as ancestral spirits, claiming that their uncle so-and-so or grandfather this or great-granddad, they're liars, they're all liars, all demons are liars. Okay, so the, the key is contact with the eyes. When you're praying, keep eye contact. Don't look away because there's something about the window of the soul through your eyes and, and, and engagement. So the, the demons hate it with a passion. They hate looking at you because they're afraid, not so much of you, but what's in you. And it's looking straight at Jesus. Listen to this. Jesus looks through your eyes. He's looking through your eyes. That's why they're afraid. They see the Son of God and they're afraid. Now, I I prayed for the little old man once in Zambia. He was only about this high. I felt really like a bully in a way because he hit the deck when I prayed for him. His eyes were going like this. So I'm calling his name and he's just like this. Just, just, oh my goodness, you know, he's going on and on. So I jammed my fingers in his eyeballs so they couldn't move. <laughs> I'm not recommending this, but it just drives you nuts. So I held them with, with two fingers and, and made him look at me. And he just, he just relaxed then. It was so quick. Once you've got the contact, you've got the ability then to keep praying and speaking. And, and they'll leave. But they all, all those little tricks they do not to look at you. So I, that's why I hold their face gently. 
don't forget this is a person you're dealing with. Gently hold the face, but be firm. And don't back down. This is not a game. This is real. Don't back down. Unless the person themselves doesn't want to proceed any further. So the moment that happens, you've got to stop. Back to point one. Do I have your agreement or do I not? Or maybe later. Then, If it's later, then, you know, it's later. All right. Any questions on, on yes, Carolyn? So Karen's question is concerning someone who's not a Christian. Do they have to confess their faith at some point? I, I wouldn't probably proceed with them unless they were able to confess faith in Jesus. In the first place. In the first place. Yeah. So part of the agreement is to, to share the gospel with them because they're going to have trouble. You could probably get rid of it if they were compliant. You can just use your own faith. All a person has to do is be compliant. You can drive the thing out. But the problem then is afterwards, what happens later if they don't come to Christ? You know, I'm not saying don't do it because I'm sure Jesus did. He just drove the spirits out of them. But they need to come to Christ. So I prefer, rather than stir the whole thing up, I prefer to lead them to the Lord first, then proceed. Because you know? there's so much about that after their profession of faith. Because sometimes those demons have been there a long time, so a little bit longer won't hurt, I think, Carolyn. Yeah. Yeah, definitely do that. Andre? Exactly. Exactly. Andre is saying that it needs, when the Spirit leads, something else has got to go. So the Holy Spirit has to seal the deal. So when you lay hands on them, that's part of the end time. When, when you know it's gone and they can feel a bit raw or whatever the state they're in, pray gently for the Holy Spirit to fill that gap and, and let them, you know, all we have to do is just to receive the Holy Spirit. That's all you have to do. He's there. And we just sit, and I pray, I seal this up in the name of Jesus Christ. Twinette. Christians have demons or is it just oppression uh, it's been our experience that they can be possessed it's just you know down through the track of years of experience of so many Christians have had demons in them um, that re- re- not even going to the Bible I know full well that that's the case they do and when we understand when we're born again it's, we're given a new spirit so we're a tripartite being, spirit, soul, and body. But as our spirit that's born again, our soul is being sanctified, which means there's areas of light in our soul and there's areas of dark. So we can have light and dark in our soul at the same time. And also, yeah, and, and there's another thing too. We have, a, we have an evil nature before we come to Christ. That gets put on the cross at your salvation and a new nature is given to you. But we have to maintain that new nature. If, if we want to go habitually back to that, then the old nature can raise its ugly head. I call it, who's playing the piano? Spirit, soul, and body, two natures. So five entities in a way. You've got a spirit, soul, and body. All of them made by God. But the, who's playing the piano? <laughs> who's ruling? Is it the old nature or the new nature? And that's the way I explain it to people. So when you're born again, your spirit is made perfect. I don't believe a demon can exist in your spirit, but they certainly can in your soul. So that's how I see, that's how I, you know, I, I think that's right, that 
that's the case. Uh, Christians should not get possessed after coming to the Lord, but it can happen. The Lord, the Lord is very reluctant to allow you to be possessed by a demon once you come to the Lord. He, he's so gracious and his hand is upon you. But if your life gets to a certain point, he may hand you over for a season. Like the apostle Paul said to the man who was sinning in the, in the church of Corinth, he said, hand him over to Satan for a season. So God allowed that demon on, that, on or in that person until they repented and then they were delivered again. So I think, yes, um, I've had people argue with me. I said, it's all very well to have an intellectual argument, but the reality is we have to deal with Christians. And many of them have got demons. <laughs> well, I think they have anyway. So in the end, I don't care whether they're in them or on them. I don't even define that. If they're troubled, pray the prayer. They'll certainly leave. You can clear them out. Yeah. Any qu- Sorry? Yes. Yes. <clears throat> when Pastor Sean Mark was here years ago, I had had. Um, so I'll just give you a little bit of back detail. So I've had issues with my mum for decades, and I thought. So then it was her birthday and I had a brother ringing me up just before we came out to that prayer meeting and um, I knew, so we had a phone call and I said, Alan, I'm not taking that phone call and then we came, I drove to the meeting and I said to myself, um, well, Lord, if Pastor Jean-Marc is able to do this sort of thing like he wasn't there for deliverance I don't he I don't know what he was there for and I said so Lord if he knows that I've got this problem he'll he'll sort it and and he did and so he asked to pray for you first and then Taya and then it was Alan and then he prayed for me and there was only nine of us in that room and we all got the shock of our lives. And so he, he was interpreting with um, Tony. And, I, and he asked me questions or something. And I'd gradually... I went down and I was horizontal with my knees. And I just... And so he prayed for me and... And um, one of the girls, Beck, Beck said, but I'm not holding her up. She's just being held up. And so John Mark, Pastor John Mark said to Taylor to put a hand on my tummy and he fairly hit my stomach and I didn't go down to the ground. I just stayed there. My, my stomach wasn't sore. And it was a fair, a fair whack that he gave, and so he delivered me. And the only and I didn't, um, I just sort of gave a grunt, you know, like with the relief of air. But I felt relief after that, and I was just like, if it can help us, delivered, and it was good. It was a good place. So, you know, sometimes I think that Christians, and you know, I probably shouldn't be saying this, but you know, like. I knew that I had issues, but I didn't think that it was a demon, but it was. He knew, God knew, and God delivered of it, me of it, and that was just, that's the best thing. And my mum and I are closer now than what we've ever been. Thank you. We just thought you were stubborn, that was all. And, uh, yeah, Carolyn. If someone puts a curse on you, does a demon come with it? Absolutely. That's the messengers of curses. Um, However, it doesn't have to land on you. Very dangerous for anyone to put a curse on a Christian. Because unbeknownst even to you, that thing can bounce off you somehow and go back to the place where it came from and trouble the cursor significantly. 
Uh, I know Ian's had a lot, a lot of experience with that. And so, you know, if you come across witches and say, listen, don't waste your time trying to curse Christians because you can be in a lot of trouble because they're protected by the Lord and you dwell in light. So unless there's a real open door in your life, they're not going to come anywhere near you. So I walk in absolute confidence, even knowing full well I make mistakes and I sin at times. I'm not open to demonic possession because of the Lord's protection upon me. And he will not allow it to happen unless I'm in extreme disobedience against him. And then only for a season. So for most of us, it's what happened prior to our coming to the Lord. For most of us. Yeah, so curses. You know, I, I've been in this town a long time. And Francis and I, I know what it's like to be oppressed. And, and to go through seasons of oppression where we know full well someone's trying to curse us or speak against us. You get a pain in the neck. You get headaches. You know, the devil can fire his darts, but he can't get close enough to whack you on the chin. That's usually what it is. And so your, your shield of faith quenches the fiery darts of the enemy, but they're like curses. And they're coming. I wouldn't be surprised if you're getting cursed all the time. All the time, trying to curse you. There'll be voices against you. You know, the accuser of the brethren is the devil. And he's already firing darts, firing darts, firing darts. You know, you know, and I'm so glad that I'm not aware of the warfare around me. For the grace of God, go us. And I'm sure that you, you probably, if, if God showed you what was going on, you, you'd be too afraid to get out of bed. You know, But praise God for his protection because you really are safe from that. Uh, we've been in Africa and we've come across curses and we've had to fight, fight through them. Um, but I've had this confidence of being able to go anywhere for God uh, and just show up. You know, people said, oh, you can't go there, there's witchcraft. I said, well, come with us and find out. We just walk there. They said, oh, don't stand on that spot. What, you mean this one? Oh, don't, what do you stand there for? Said, that's, that's the gateway. I said, well, I'll just seal it up in the name of Jesus. They said, why live in fear? We're sons of God. And so we don't have to be cocky, but we certainly don't have to be living a, a, a lesser life because there's things around us. We met a man who couldn't eat fish. We said, we'll pray with you. He said, there's a demon on me. I said, we know. We'll pray with you. He said, no. We said, why? He said, because you're going to leave and I'm going to have to face it afterwards. I said, but don't you like fish? I love fish. He was the guy catching fish for us. <laughs> so, so you get what I'm talking about. We live with absolute confidence in him. No fear of anything in, in that dark world whatsoever. It can't touch you, really. You can certainly feel the effects. Sicknesses can come. Words can hurt. But really, it's, it bounces off you. The Lord gives you permission to condemn the person who sends a curse. I'd be careful about that. Because the Lord says to bless and do not curse. And the reason why... Again, I'll be careful about anything with the person because what comes out of your mouth is so powerful. Now, speak to the situation. Speak to, speak to it, to the demon. Don't speak. Be careful about humans because you know, you, you're so strong, you don't realize that if you curse somebody... You can cause them a lot of trouble in their lives. Mm -hmm. Be very careful as Christians what's coming out of your mouth because you can cause trouble for their lives. And um, you can shut them down. You can shut people down. And uh, the last thing you want to do is to be that kind of person because the Lord says that for a reason, that we should bless because the blessing is also powerful. God is ready to act on your word. So you be careful. I don't even think you have to condemn anything, really. I mean, let them try. Um, I just don't see where we need to really fight for that Un unless you really are feeling oppressed and then it's just get off in Jesus name <laughs> amen it's 12 o'clock time for one more question Lennon
That's fine, because you're protecting your own space in a house where you can't deal with everything because there's people living there. So you're the, you're the saint operating there and you're protecting your space. So yeah, absolutely, you've got to do that. Simon? Hmm. Yeah, speak to the devil. Yeah. That's what um, Smith Wigglesworth, they got upset with him because he was so abrupt. He said, I'm not speaking to you. I'm speaking through you to the demon. So don't get upset. I'm not actually talking to you talking to what's through you so people used to get upset with him well how dare you speak to me like that uh, I don't no I don't think we have the power to assign a place to a demon because it's not in the scriptures um, they know Probably something's going to happen to them once it's come out of you, or them, or wherever. Uh, so I don't, I don't know. I think the scripture says they go into dry places. That's where they go because where are they going to go? They've been cast out, so now they're wanderers. They will wander around looking for somewhere else to go. But I don't think you need to say anything. That's where they're going to go anyway. They're going to go into a dry place can't be anywhere near where the Holy Spirit is or where the church is. Yes, I, I don't have to worry about sending them anywhere. Mary? Did you hear what Mary said? Walking with that person. Yeah, encouraging them. Yes. Yeah, I think through extreme disobedience, the Lord may allow it. I think so, because I, I'm, I'm convinced the Lord's hands on my life. And in the scriptures, it says, even though we are unfaithful, He is always faithful. So he's operating in his own faithfulness over us as Christians so that we don't get repossessed or come under that thing. But we know it does happen in extreme cases. It's not a formula. I just assume that I'm operating in his name. So you can say, in the name of Jesus, remember him? I bind you. Um, but I don't like to say Jesus to start with because the, with some of them, they're so fast to manifest. The moment you say Jesus, they're gone. And so I say, I bind you. I forbid you to speak. Because God said, we will cast out demons. And just so I could, you know, if, if you've got a sore leg, I say, in the name of Jesus, or, or leg be healed right now, I'm speaking in his name whether I say it or not. Sometimes it helps us to say in the name of Jesus. That helps our faith, I think. As long as you realize that he, you, it's not you, it is the Lord. As long as you realize that, I think. But I've, I've just said, bind, I bind you. And it works. So they obeyed. 